Next up, an honored member of the Boston Dow, Spencer Brody. Okay, yeah, we'll see. Just in case. Thank you. Um, cool. All right, everyone, welcome. Super excited to be here today. I'm Spencer, and I am very excited to talk to you all about the power of decentralized technology. I think we're probably all familiar a little bit with decentralized technology. It's what brought us here. It's what's given us incredible things like the blockchain, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, DeFi, all kinds of great stuff. But uh, there's a little bit of a, a trend in some of those things I just named. And I would like to argue that decentralized, oh, did I go? There we go. Decentralized technology is about more than just money. That's not to knock the financial use cases. They're incredibly important. But I think a lot more has been said to talk about the vision and the value that comes from decentralized tech for really incredible things like financial access and inclusion, banking the unbanked, uh, freedom from financial censorship, borderless payments, you know, and really just giving people control over their, their funds and their financial destinies. This is incredibly important, but I think, at least in this audience, that vision is fairly well understood. I'd like to talk about, you know, the fact that that is just the beginning, and decentralized tech can be used for so much more. And so today in particular, I want to talk about decentralized data. And so what's the big deal about data? Just to give you a little bit of a, a, a taste of the kind of scale of what we're talking about here, um, take these exact numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt. They're just from like a pretty simple Google search. But uh, from my you know, highly advanced research I, <laughs> of like three minutes on Google, found that there's roughly a billion credit card transactions per day. Compare that to four billion Facebook posts a day. Just posts. Another four billion likes and comments, 10 billion direct messages. All that's just on one platform, Facebook. That does not include other social apps, Twitter, Instagram, uh, uh, you know, TikTok, whatever, or any of the other non-social media applications online. How many emails are sent a day? How many, you know, LinkedIn profiles or people submitting their taxes on TurboTax, right? Like almost every single interaction we have online is backed by data in some form. And so when you think about the scale of the number of data transactions compared to financial transactions that happen worldwide every day, it's so many orders of magnitude. It's an entirely different world. So if we can start to take some of the same benefits and value that we've taken from decentralizing financial systems and money and apply that to data, the potential for transformation for our society is, is huge. Um, so this is what I like to talk about is called the, the dataverse, this idea of decentralized data and what it enables. So what is the dataverse? The dataverse is the composable web scale data ecosystem owned by everyone and no one which powers the metaverse. So I think that begs the obvious question, well, okay, then what's the metaverse? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not whatever that is. <laughs> whatever Mark Zuckerberg wants you to think the metaverse is, that's not what we're talking about today. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of people use the word metaverse and use it in different ways. When I use it, I use it in a pretty broad definition. So I think a lot of people think about like VR and AR when they think about the metaverse. I think that that might be a part of the metaverse, but I think of it as something much broader. I think of the metaverse as the entirety of all composable and interoperable resources, identities, apps, platforms, services, and protocols that exist in cyberspace. So what does that mean? That basically just means the, the next generation of the internet, right? It is the open, interoperable app development platform where instead of having these big siloed monolithic apps, we have an interconnected ecosystem of open source, open protocol driven apps that interoperate and create a new powerful and immersive experience for users. And in order for that to work, it needs to be powered by a data layer, an open data layer that can provide a shared high performance, always available graph of all data created and used by all applications. And in this world, users are at the center. They control their data. They bring their data with them to applications instead of data being trapped in whatever application happened to be used when that data was created. This shared dataverse is going to unlock an incredible new world for users and people interacting online. 
but that's going to be built by developers who are empowered to create new and incredible experiences. So I want to start by talking about how this dataverse enables developers. This golden age of app development will be built on top of shared network effects that are powered by reusable data models and enable modular front ends. So shared network effects, I really think this is the crux. This is the core, is the power of composability and interoperability, which enable these shared network effects, which unlock the ability for developers to create things that are, that are not being created today. Um, one of the big challenges in app development these days is what is often called the cold start problem, which is that you have a new app launches, it sounds really cool, people are excited, they show up, and no one's there. There's, no one's using it, there's no content, there's nothing to do because it's brand new. Uh, and so you get stuck in this catch-22 where the app's only useful once enough people are using it, and no one wants to use it until it's useful. So actually creating new applications is really, really hard, and it's why the, the tech monopolies have had such incredible staying power because they control the network effects and no one else can reasonably compete. This stifles innovation and stifles creativity and limits the types of experiences we get to have online because the only people who can innovate, the only people who can really create anything new are Facebook, Google, Amazon, right? There's like very little opportunity for new players to enter. Um, and so I want to create a sort of hypothetical counter example, right? I think a lot about um, sort of the way we consume content online these days, sort of social, through social media and news, but really there's so much content online and we're increasingly relying on algorithms as a way to, to consume that information, right? But we're really subject to, again, the whims of a small number of players who control those algorithms. Facebook, Twitter, they have their algorithms. You don't like it, that, you're out of luck. Um, we should live in a world where there's lots of different approaches to surfacing content, where developers can experiment and try out new approaches, and users have choice about how content is surfaced to them. So let's say you had a team of machine learning experts, and you're like, I can build a better algorithm. I want to build an algorithm that doesn't show false or misleading information, only shows fact-checked information, or I want to do an algorithm that doesn't surface based on engagement, which we know really just means conflict and controversy, but I'm going to build an algorithm that services content that a lot of people agree on, that, that we can all sort of come together around, or maybe an algorithm that only shows me information that my friends have interacted with, or an algorithm that shows me information that's contrary to what I'm usually exposed to, to give me, get me exposed to other ideas, right? We should be able to experiment. We should be able to try out different approaches, see what works, see how it affects society, see how, what users, how users react. Users should have that choice. But right now, if you're a developer, and you're like, I can build a better algorithm, you can't just build that algorithm. You have to build an entire social networking site, get people to adopt it, get people to, to, to register, to follow people, to start sharing content, create an entire ecosystem just to even begin to start experimenting with the algorithm. In this new world, where if instead all of the content and all the information we're consuming were on an open data platform, now you can unlock this experimentation where it's developers can focus just on their core of expertise. Like, I want to build an algorithm, I can just build the algorithm and not need to worry about all the other parts because I can just plug in to the ecosystem that already exists. In this way, apps become a lot narrower and a lot more focused, and developers can focus on where they can add unique value. And now it's possible to get developers to try new things because they're not reinventing the entire, the entire world from the ground up. They can just focus on their core expertise. This unlocks what I like to call the um, compounding innovation effect, where someone builds a, an app, it's great, people like it, another developer comes along, says, wow, this app's awesome. You know what, it would be, I really wish it had this one extra feature though. Today, you have to wait for that, to wait and hope that that original development team builds the feature you want. In this new world, that developer would come and could build that feature themselves because they have access to the underlying data they can add that new feature and add that value back into the ecosystem. And this creates value for everyone involved. Users benefit from having a new feature that is hopefully useful and that they like. The, the new developer benefits from being able to build that feature and perhaps receive some comp compensa financial compensation for the value that's created from that feature. And the original app developer benefits because that new feature made their original app more useful, more valuable, more people want to use it. If these systems are well-designed, both developers or developer teams 
can receive financial compensation for the value they've generated for the ecosystem. That allows, it basically does to data what DeFi did to money. In, where in DeFi, you have all these different protocols, all these different smart contracts that interconnect and that can build on each other and that can add new value and new features into the collective ecosystem that is DeFi. And the whole ecosystem gets stronger as a result. So we've talked a little bit about how the composability, please don't try to read the slide. <laughs> um, we've talked a little bit about how the composability unlocks uh, uh, more ability for developers to, to build new things that they couldn't before. But it's also just gonna make it easier to build applications. So, so this image, some people might have seen something like it. It's a, a database schema design diagram. It's like a UML diagram showing uh, like database tables and their relations to other database tables. Um, very commonly used in sort of database schema design for applications. Um, so I'm curious, I'm sure we have uh, some developers in the audience. Who here has ever like read or written or used a, a diagram kind of like this? Uh, you know, okay, yeah, good number. Okay, who here enjoyed that experience? That's about what I thought. Uh, so much time and energy is spent on database schema design today when so much of that work is redundant. Think about how many e-commerce apps there must be out there where their databases schemas probably look so similar, right? They all have a product catalog table, an orders table, and maybe an inventory table and a user's table. Uh, but every e-commerce app has to, has to build this from scratch, reinvent the wheel over and over again. Why are we wasting all this time redoing the same work? What if instead building a new e-commerce app looked more like installing an open source software library? So this is an image from Cargo. It's the Rust communities package lab manager, but it's very similar to something like NPM for the JavaScript ecosystem, PIP for Python, Go has its own integrated package manager. Every major modern programming language has a package manager that makes it very easy to install open source libraries. You run a single command, now your app is set up to use this, this library and get the functionality that it provides. We can do the same thing for data. Now if you want to build uh, uh, e-commerce app, you go, I want the product catalog data model, the inventory data model, the orders data model, click, 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 install five minutes later, you have a database or database-like system set up that can read and write data in the appropriate schemas with the appropriate indexes and query APIs ready to power your app. It takes the, the start time to get building from days or weeks to minutes. This, again, leads back to that unlocking developer creativity and giving them power to build fast. It also enables these types of um, modular front ends. So we've already seen this growing movement around no code and low code solutions. Now, when those types of solutions can also be backed by these reusable data models, now you can have fully vertically integrated features that have a UI and a database backend and can plug into the ecosystem of data that already exists. So you could have a like user profile viewer and editor widget or module, right? That then any application can install, have access to profile features and get access to all the profiles created by any other application that builds on the same profile model. Uh, you can have reusable like direct messaging, commenting, voting systems, all that interoperate and interconnect with all the apps that are using the same model. This is already starting to happen. These images are actually taken from um, Orbis, which is a startup that is building reusable social components so that to make it really easy to drag and drop social features into an application and they build on top of Ceramic, which is a, a sort of open data layer trying to do this. Um, these types of all of the things we just talked about, this like, you know, ease of data reuse, ease of composability, lower barrier to entry, uh, ability for developers to focus, this is going to unlock incredible experiences for regular people who use the internet. This new internet is going to be, have experiences organized around the user where they have control over their experience, interests and interactions online. The magic of interoperability will create seamless user experiences and lower switching costs that enable experimentation and innovation. That creativity unlocked for developers will, will create incredible new, new types of apps we haven't ever seen before. And all of that progress and knowledge will, will result in incredible experiences for the, for the human species. So, 
Experience is organized around the user. In this world, users are at the center. They bring their data with them. All these little images can sort of represent these icons, those sort of same reusable data models we talked about before. And so in this world, users bring their da data to apps. Even the idea of what is an app starts to blur. You no longer have these big monolithic applications that try to do everything. Um, you have smaller, more targeted apps and features that can be composed up into more complicated applications. So instead of going to the social app, a user can say, okay, here's my favorite text editor for creating long form text content. Here's my favorite video editor. Here's my favorite UI for the sort of news feed. Here's my favorite algorithm for servicing content. Here's the content moderation system I want put on top of that stitch all of that together and create a unified social experience custom tailored to that user's preferences and needs. This control will also come with uh, more transparency over how data is being used. You'll be able to see, because it's all on this open ledger, you'll be able to see exactly how your data, what apps are using your data and how. And you'll have control for things like privacy to be able to see, okay, what data is public, what data is encrypted, what's private. And you'll have more, more options around things like pseudonymity. Ooh, that's a hard word to say. Um, you'll be pseudonymous by default. You'll have probably multiple different identifiers. It, you get to choose what data gets associated to which identity. So you might have your sort of public professional identity with your real name and your real profile picture that you use in certain professional contexts. And another identity that is pseudonymous with an avatar that you use in certain online communities. Every interaction you have online, you get to choose what data gets associated with which identity and what with what other data, and which data stays separate and, un and unlinked from each other. Uh, you'll also be able to experiment with different types of like monetization strategies, right? You could choose between you know, something free with ads or paid with a subscription, or even new uh, monetization strategies that weren't possible in Web2, like access via contribution where if you contribute value to a community and those contributions are tracked on a uh, verifiable data ledger, now, by being able to prove this, that you contributed value to a community, the community might say, great, like, thank you so much for those contributions. You can have access to some of these resources or services. Um, the magic of interoperability makes these experiences so much more seamless for users. Now, instead of having to enter you know, manage a million and one passwords, having to re-enter the same basic profile information on every site you go to, um, even having to set certain settings over and over again, right? I can just, I want dark mode everywhere I go. Why do I have to set dark mode on every new site I go to? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just set in a single user preferences document, I want dark mode. And every site I go to can read that and see, and customize the experience to my needs and my preferences as soon as I grant them access to read that data from my, you know, that's associated with my, with my preferences. Um, interoperable social graphs are incredibly valuable for making it easier to, to move out the internet and have social features that weave throughout. Now, every time you switch to a new sort of social app or social experience, you don't have to refind and refollow everyone you're interested in. Your, your follower list comes with you. It's also really powerful for content creators. If you've built a big audience on a given platform, say for like, you know, your blogging platform, and now you want to start creating video content, you don't have to worry, how is my audience gonna find me on this new platform? Now as soon as they switch to that platform, they'll find you because their social graph comes with them. Um, this enables, this experimentation, this ease of switching, being able to try out different approaches and move between things more seamlessly, uh, gives users a lot more choice and, uh, and options. Um, one thing I think a lot about is like, uh, a content moderation. You don't like the way your social site is doing content moderation. You think that they are taking down too many posts and that that is censorship of free speech. Or you think that they're not doing enough to take down false news or misleading news or hateful content. You can choose, switch. You can switch to a different platform with a different approach. In fact, even the idea of content moderation likely becomes a value add service added on top. You have the base layer of all of the content, you have the algorithm surfacing content, and then you have content moderation on top, and all of these are interoperable and pluggable, and users get to build, choose what approach they want to take. All of this, ease of switching cost, ability for developers to focus on where they add the most value without having to reinvent the wheel, the interoperability and interconnectivity, unlocks developer creativity and experimentation and innovation, which is going to give us 
whole new types of applications that we cannot even imagine that we have not seen yet. Because we have not seen creativity online in, in at least the last decade because the only people who can innovate are the big tech monopolies. By creating these smaller, more modular, interoperable apps, we get an internet that is that where people can experiment again, where things feel creative and new and exciting, and we get to actually see real innovation happen for the first time in over a decade. Um, running out of time here, but uh, I think there's so much even more that can be said about the value for society and human and, and science. Right, connecting the entire scientific community on a single, shared, verifiable data platform has huge implications for science. I think there's a lot of interesting things that can be said about data science done over this big data dataverse of, of interconnected data. Right, if you could actually study social media, see how, you know, what are the effects of social media on teen mental health? What are the effects of changes to the algorithm on political uh, uh, division, right? We can't do those studies right now because all that data is held hostage by Twitter and Facebook. If they were actually on, even for the public tweets, the public data that, were, that is theoretically public, you still can't do data science on it because you have to go through Twitter's API. If that data was actually accessible to data scientists, what, what might we learn about society? So in conclusion, Dataverse empowers developers to build rich experiences. The interoperability unlocks creativity and innovation, giving us magical, seamless, customized experiences. Users have control and choice and are at the center of their, of their interactions online. Um, if any of this sounds interesting to you, I'd encourage you to come, come check out, learn about a little bit about Ceramic, where we're trying to build the infrastructure to enable decentralized data at the scale of the internet that we need to make this work. Um, and if you're interested in sort of technically how we can actually achieve that scale, that incredible scale, come check out our talk at 3.30. Uh, future is bright, everyone. Thank you. Oh, and this next panel is going to be awesome. Uh, Fantastic. A lot of the same topics. You should check it out. Wow. That's really cool. Um, I'm excited for the future. I mean, this is, I love hearing talks from developers and blowing my mind what's coming and what's on the way. That's really cool.